We've had so much positive feedback about hearing classic episodes of The Meaningful Life that I'm going to start hand-picking my favourites, the ones where I learnt something important. But let's go back to the very first episode. What could be more important to a meaningful life than great sex? But that changes as we go through different life stages. We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. My witness today is Tracy Cox. Tracy is an international sex, body language, and relationship expert. She has a weekly column on The Mail Online, and she's the author of Good Sex Starts at 50, How to Age-Proof Your Libido. I mean, what the most fabulous title that is. And as I was reading the book, there were lots of times when I was sort of punching the air and going, go for it, because you're saying so many things that I think are important. We'll, we'll come on to those in a, in a moment. But I think it's really, really interesting, this whole idea of a book for people who are 50. So how are we different at 50? Is it what makes our life meaningful in our 50s different from earlier in our life? What, what do you think as somebody who has crossed that threshold? Absolutely crossed the threshold, um, sadly. The interesting thing is, this is my 17th book about sex. And seriously, up until writing this book, I thought, well, what can I say that I haven't already said before? Then I turned 50 and suddenly I realised there was a hell of a lot more to say because sex after 50 is very, very different than sex before 50. And for me, it was a bit of a wake-up call because I just thought, honestly, that it's not going to happen to me. You know, I'm really fit. I've got a great libido. I've written so many books about sex. Nothing's going to happen to me after 50. And then it did. And it was just like, oh, my God, this is completely different. So this is why I think the book is very, very important because it is, it, it, look, sex after 50 is different. It's not necessarily worse. It's not necessarily better. It's just a very different ball game, literally, than it was beforehand. And do you think we're different people after 50? I think we're completely different people after 50. I certainly am. I mean, I, I think I'm much kinder now. I think pre-50, I was very driven, very ambitious. I worked my ass off constantly. That's all I did was work, really. Everything else was secondary to my career. I guess at 50, I was happy with where I was at career-wise. And I met my husband and got into a really good second marriage, but a, a really lovely relationship, which helped. But I think what's changed after 50 for me is that it's, it's, I lost that having to be the best at everything. I lost that image thing about having to be seen at the right restaurants, having to, you know, have the best of, you know, if everybody else had that bag, I had to, well, maybe not that bag. It was more like I had to be at the right restaurant. It was just a big, total, utter vanity stuff. And honestly, I, I look out there, I live in Notting Hill, and you can see everybody walking past from the apartment. And I used to look out the window and I'd see these really beautifully dressed girls and go, wow, she looks amazing. And now I look out the window and I think, Christ Almighty, I mean, she, you know, the amount of wankers around this area, I think you completely and utterly rethink your values, don't you? Things become very, different things become important to you. And how is your second marriage different from your first marriage now that you're older and kinder in your own words? Um, I think the first marriage was very, I got married when I was 30. I'd been with him very happily for about four or five years before we got married. And I think it was actually getting married that ruined that relationship because I had so many, I, I was not a huge fan of it. I didn't want to get married. He wanted to get married. And my dad had left my mum when I was 15. He had an affair. I had loads of issues over that. So I was not a big fan of marriage at all. So I really shouldn't have done it. When I got married, I just felt so restricted and, and like I could see the rest of my life stretching out in front of me. And I didn't want to be able to see the rest of my life. I wanted change. I wanted surprise. And it was just like, oh my God, this is going to be it. I'm never going to sleep with anyone again. I'm never going to do anything interesting. And my poor husband, honestly, he was such a nice man, but I, I just hated it. And I remember saying to him, listen, can we actually get divorced but stay together? Because it's not you have gone off. 
it's marriage. And he wouldn't do that. He was very conservative. But I, I'm, I wonder whether that would have worked, really. And do you think after 50, you can make your own rules up? So if you want to marry somebody, divorce them and still stay with them, that's fine when you're 50. But at 30, oh, my God, what will people think? Yes, very much what will people think. And and just sort of, yes, it is completely different post 50. I have to say, I married my second husband, Miles, and I was a bit nervous about getting married, actually. I was a bit like, well, did we really? We ended up getting married for my mum and then, not that she's religious or anything, far from it, but she sort of would have loved it and then she got sick and couldn't come to the wedding. So it was a bit of a nightmare from start to finish, but it was a lovely day. But I was really worried that that was going to muck up my relationship. And so I spoke to Miles and I said, if it does, can we get divorced again? He was like, fine. And that's the difference between the two people. I tell you what, in, the, in my early, my first marriage, I was very competitive. He was very competitive. We were a bit competitive with each other. With this relationship, we were a team. We're an absolute team. We That whole thing about do you want to be right or do you want to be happy, we just both want to be happy. We're very good at resolving conflict. We're very good at giving in, saying sorry, you know, all that sort of stuff, which is, which is really hard to find. And also, he's just the right person. I think all my other relationships have been – quite hard work to be honest and this relationship not that it's not work because all relationships are but it's just so easy I think I've just found somebody who I'm really compatible with and tell me more about what does being kinder mean because I I really do believe that there is an opportunity as we get older to be kinder and I just wonder what that word means to you I think kind I mean when I wrote I mean I found all this stuff on my computer when I was going through some stuff and all these must-have partner qualities that I had written down. And I mean, I look at them and I think, oh my God, like really, there was kind was not on any list. And yet, to me, it's the most obvious thing that kindness is the most important thing. I and mean, if somebody's kind, it's it's just the most important quality of all time. And I think you you just put everything else first when you're younger. Your looks are very important, money is very important, you know, how driven they are, how ambitious, how bright they were. All this stuff, of course, is also important as well. Social skills are important, but kindness is integral to everything, isn't it? If somebody's kind, that goes across everything from when you're having sex to in your relationship to how they treat your family, how they treat their friends, how they treat the world. It is the most important quality. So this programme is called The Meaningful Life, and you're my witness today to help explore what makes life meaningful. And, you know, I have this suspicion, and I'd like to talk to you about it, that sex fits somewhere into having a meaningful life. What do you think? I think sex very much does fit into having a meaningful life. And I think pre-50, post-50, it has different functions. Like, I think sex is incredibly primal. I mean, when you're in the grips of lust, you are truly alive you would do anything like give up anything just to get your hands on that person isn't it I mean it's one of the most powerful feelings in the whole world to to want somebody that you've never had or you know when you've just started to experience having sex with them sadly this type of feeling is the thing that is the rarest sex of all isn't it I mean it, it probably accounts for about Gosh, I don't know. How, how would you put Five times in your whole life. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of like that. It's, well, a bit more than that, Andrew. Come on, at the beginning, it's quite good. But I mean, this is the feeling that makes us realise we are alive. It's very primitive. But that type of sex, of course, doesn't last, as we've said. And I hate that we perpetuate that myth, actually, that that is sex, because it's not sex. Real life sex is gentler, it's softer, it's it's less intentional, but it's no less pleasurable. Because, you know, when if you're in a like relationship where that initial bit's worn off, it's very much, you know, you know each other's buttons to push, you know how to give each other a good orgasm. It's much less hurried, much less orgasm focused. And that, I think, that's the type of sex that really does give you meaning when it's with somebody who you really care for. Look, casual sex is great. As a sexual experience, you can have the best sex of your life with somebody that you've never met before. But to have really meaningful sex, I think you have to be with somebody that you really care for. So what do we mean by meaningful sex? Sex that lasts beyond the orgasm would be a very simple definition. It's like the minute the orgasm's over, do you want to leave that person? Do you want to get up and move away? Or do you want to be with that person? I think that's something. And maybe maybe having less 
orgasm focused sex, you know, being happy to, you know, just sit there with each other, to be with somebody naked, to touch them, lick them, you know, feel them, be with them, watch them, experience pleasure. I love that idea that the sex lasts after the orgasm, that somehow, I don't know, making a cup of tea together afterwards, or even just walking down the street, there's a sort of glow that lasts past the bedroom door. And that is sort of still part of sex, do you think? Of course it is. Or am I being exaggerating? No, I think you exactly. I mean, whenever I have sex with my husband, we afterwards just feel so much closer. And so and a bit like, you know, high five, you know, we did it, you know, which by the way, wine and Netflix does get in the way of our having sex. So we're quite pleased with ourselves when we've done it, especially if it's all gone really well and everybody's happy and, you know, or we tried something new, especially. I mean, I think it's just a really bonding feeling. Sex is incredibly meaningful. And if there is no sex in your life, do you think it begins to take too much importance in the meaningful life, that somehow the absence is almost more important than having a sex life? I think that can happen, but I I think you can always have sex in your life, whether you're single or with a partner, by masturbating and using sex toys. Quite frankly, some of the best sex sessions we have in our lives are with ourselves. So there's absolutely no need for somebody not to have sex in their life. And that can be just as pleasurable, give you meaning as well. I mean, orgasm is an incredible sensation. It's incredibly good for your body. It's great for your mental state, hence the lockdown. I mean, as you know, Andrew, I've got a range of sex toys with Love Honey and the profits just went up and up and up during lockdown because people were having sex with themselves. So you never have to be without sex in your life. So what I was reading through your book, there were several things that I punched the air of. And the one that actually is the biggest one for me is when you said, Spontaneous sex is overrated. Now, why do you say that and why do I punch the air, do you think? Because it is absolutely the the thing that every single person is hung up on. And this whole idea that passion and desire are just going to tap you on the shoulder. You're going to look at you're going to look at your partner that you've been with for 20 years and suddenly go, oh my God, I just have to rip your clothes off. It doesn't happen in real life. You have to create desire. And this is what really mucks people up with sex, because I think we all have this this sort of concept that a good sex life is just you know rolling over suddenly thinking yeah let's you know let's let's have great sex right now this minute and and it's not just you that wants to have it your partner's got to want to have it at exactly the same point otherwise exactly it doesn't happen does it no and and life gets in the way as we talked about that early buzz of sex when you're so consumed by desire for your partner it goes away it's all hormonal so then you're left with each other and you know we are we, human beings you know when you do the same thing over and over we become less enamored with it you have to create desire you have to work out when is the best time for us to have sex when both of us are likely to feel like it in a long-term relationship there are so many compromises you, you know you might spontaneously feel like sex when your wife's just had a baby and she's just about to have the first night's sleep that she's had in five years that is not the right time to have sex. Planning sex, which everybody just hates me saying that, is the best way to ensure that long-term sex happens and it's good. Seriously. There's one person who doesn't hate you for saying that. That's me, because I'm on the same campaign as you, that I say to people, it's okay, you can have just spontaneous sex, but you'll have spontaneous sex three times a year when you're on holiday when you're on holiday together and you've got enough time to sort of get into the same grooves as each other, perhaps Valentine's night and, you know, there's one bonus session, but that's all you're going to have. <laughs> I totally agree with you. But beyond you and me, we'd probably make a great couple because <laughs> we would both be prepared to plan the sex. Why is planning sex so bad as other people think? Two reasons. I think that first of all, we've fed this myth so much. Like, honestly, every single TV show that you watch, you are given long-term couples having hot, spontaneous sex. So it's this constant having to fight that myth. And I have to sit there, and you and I know about this. We know it's not true, but you actually have to sit there. And I'm sitting there with my husband. I'm looking at him thinking, Christ, I hope he's not thinking, why aren't we doing that? I hope he knows. So that's us. Imagine how the average person feels who isn't like that. And the other thing is, I don't know why people are so against planning you would never not plan and go you know when you go to a restaurant you look up where is a good restaurant to go you look at the menu you know you work out what time or that's great look at the reviews you plan it 
to make sure that you're picking the right restaurant, you're going to have a pleasurable experience. When we're cooking meals, we don't just make the same thing that we did when we were 18 every single day for the rest of our life. For some reason, it's the only thing in the world that we are resistant to planning. People are happy to plan relationships, aren't they? But sex, no, I don't know why. I think there's something like if I plan ahead and say that I'm going to have sex on Saturday night... And, you know, in all faithfulness, I can say today, I'm up for sex on Saturday night. Then on Saturday night, I don't fancy it. Mm. What if I promise something I can't deliver? Right, yeah, maybe. You know, isn't that ridiculous? I've never even thought about that part of it. But it probably is that. But the other thing is, I think people think it's, whenever I talk to people about it, they're worried about the, the lack of spontaneity, meaning it's going to be all forced and awkward and like we're only doing it because we feel like we have to. But... I always say, don't just plan sex, plan something new to do. So you're anticipating something new. If you just say, right, we're going to have missionary position, lights off sex, that's not very exciting. But if you say, right, it's your turn to plan something, let's try a new position, let's try it in a different room, let's try it, then it becomes something that you look forward to. So give me five suggestions that people listening to our podcast could try. Well, I always say, if you just change one small thing, Every single time you have sex, that might be clothes on, maybe your partner strips you rather than being naked. It might be in another room. It might be something as exciting as facing the opposite end of the bed, which your brain gets very excited by, just subtle changes, things like that. Have a tie-up game. The thing is, you don't really have to think of these things yourself because if you just go online and Google, you know, new things to try in bed, you will have a million, million suggestions. So it's not like we're hard up for inspiration. Tell them your fantasy. Talk to them. Don't talk. Have sex that just involves foreplay. Have a ban on intercourse. I like that one. A ban on intercourse. Yes. And what? Why would? Why would that be interesting? I think it really, really works, especially for over fifties, because it's the bit of sex that I think is the least pleasurable for most of women, and the most stressful for lots of men, especially if you're having erection difficulties and your premature ejaculation. So that is the most stressful part of sex for most people. Because the other thing that made me pump the air is that you can have hot sex without an erection, says Tracy. So explain that to the men listening, because unfortunately, you know, I'm a man. I've been told that if there's no erection in the room, then you have to pack up and go home. Mm. That was the, one of the saddest bits of the book to write for me, is that you try, I interviewed lots of men about this, and I have done over the years, and trying to get it through to men that, in fact, if your penis is not erect, you can still have a very sexy time in bed by giving pleasure to her. You don't actually need an erection to orgasm. And they just can't get it. It's like desire is all about having a, an erect penis. I don't understand. Well, because I don't have a penis. I don't. Women don't think like that. We don't think, right, because my vagina is not lubricating, that must mean that I'm not going to have a good time. Some of my clients do feel that. Do they? And I'm afraid some men also measure their sexual attractiveness on the lubrication of their partner's vagina. They do, actually. I mean, I always say to people, don't you have any fingers and tongues? Because fingers and tongues, they never wear out. Yeah, exactly. Listening to you and I, you know that tongues (laughs) never wear out. But that is exactly true. And most women do not have their orgasms through penetration. And that is the other thing that doesn't seem to get through men is that penises, maybe because they don't want to think that the penis isn't the big star, but penises aren't the star of sex for most women. Not that penetration doesn't feel great because it can do, but it's seriously, that's not the main act for most women. It's what you do with your tongue, what you do with your fingers, what you do with a vibrator in bed that is going to make her orgasm. It's not going to be intercourse. So here's another thing that I pumped the air for. Desire isn't the only motivation for sex. So what could other motivations for sex be beyond desire? Now, this is what gets me in trouble all the time, and I get very frustrated. If you dare to say that desire isn't the motivation, that possibly, just possibly, in a long-term relationship, you might actually have sex when you don't really feel like it to please your partner, I get all sorts of criticism, like, how dare you? This is not consent, etc. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about it is going to be a rare time in a long-term relationship, especially if it's a long, long long-term relationship, where both of you feel like sex at the same time. Sometimes you might not feel like sex and they really feel like sex and you might have sex with them to please them because it's a kind thing to do, because it's a giving thing to do. Kindness again. Yes, it's kindness, 
generosity because also you know well hopefully in a good relationship that if you felt like sex and they didn't necessarily they would also have sex with you it's give and take in a relationship and here's one of the things that i don't think people realize and that you and i know because we hear it all the time that you might start off thinking actually you know yeah i'm doing this out of kindness out of generosity but actually two or three minutes in, you suddenly start saying, oh, this is nice. And actually, this is really good. And yes, actually, I'm really up for it. So that if you have more foreplay, that you are lying and you're cuddling and you're stroking, and that is absolutely lovely, that you might be converted or invited into sex, even if when you start this process, that you don't feel like this. Especially if you're a woman, because the way our cycle of desire works compared to a, a man is often very different. And I've forgotten the name of it now. What is it again? Um, spontaneous desire and what's the other name? Anyway, it, it's about how you often don't feel like sex until you start being stimulated. And then all of a sudden you start to feel like sex. Now, this, of course, only works in a relationship where, I mean, if, if you want to use that way to explore whether you want to have sex or not, you've also got to have a nice partner, kind partner, who then understands if you if you start to go with it and then you're like, you know what, I really don't feel like it. Maybe I can do something to, you know, to give you some oral sex or something, then can I stop? You have to have a partner that's willing to give it the old college try, but then if it doesn't work, he's not going to hassle you. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And actually, if you have sensuality in your relationship as well as sex, that you can actually, if you've said we're going to have time to have sex on Saturday night, Mm. and when you get to it, you don't feel like intercourse. But I don't think anybody's ever too tired or feels that they don't want to have sensuality of stroking and holding and actually just doing nice things to each other's body. Mm. And so that even if you can't deliver sex, you can deliver sensuality. And I find that most people, when they actually experience deep sensuality, not just a (laughs) sort of kind of me wildly stroking with no passion at all, when you've actually had real sensuality, which is really stroking and enjoying the touch, both receiving it and giving that touch, that gives you another option. So you're not stuck in the we're having passionate sex or we're on the opposite sides of the bed. Mm. And I think that's a very, very good point. And and people, we have lots of different types of sex. Sometimes we have passionate sex. Sometimes it's sensual. Sometimes it's quite, you know, it's like scratching an itch because you feel like having an orgasm. Other times it's loving. Other times it's romantic. There are so many different types of sex. We don't always have to have passionate sex. And the other thing is about sex that that, uh, it's become a strong thing for me, especially post-50 working with couples, is that if you don't feel like sex, there's nothing to stop you doing something to your partner. Like if they really feel like sex, give them some oral sex, you know, do a hand job, hold a vibrator, do something, or let them masturbate in front of you. There's plenty of low effort sex options. Whisper rude and dirty nothings in their ears. Exactly. As they're doing it. Perfect. So we've got the other end of the scale. I love my partner, but I don't want to have sex with them anymore. So what do you do with that one? That was the other hardest thing in the book to write. And everyone's like, well, what's the answer? What's the answer? And the answer is it's lots of little things. Something that I think is very, very hard and sort of sad in the world, not in the world, in terms of sex therapy is that often love and sex breed of different things, don't they? What you need for a really lovely love relationship, you need security, you need routine, you need to know that your partner won't be unfaithful, you need to feel comfortable. That feeds love. What feeds desire is forbiddenness, it's feeling uncomfortable, it's feeling eroticism, it's all the things that you don't get in a long-term relationship. So we always think about love and sex as being good bedfellows, but in fact they're not. They they don't like each other. So Lots of couples, it's often the closest couples who have the worst sex and the couples who have these really traumatic relationships who have great sex. That is an incredibly hard thing where you absolutely love your partner, but you don't want to have sex with them. And it's because your brain gets all these signals that are the wrong signals for desire. So you actually have to then, again, know this and then build desire through other ways, using role play, using fantasy, using all sorts of things. I would agree with every last thing you've said, but I would also ask people to look a bit deeper because 
sometimes we don't want to have sex with people because we're angry with them. Oh, yeah. And actually, anger is the biggest switch off. Now, we might not actually consciously say, you know, I'm angry because he snores in bed. Um, it's not as simple as that. There are often things that we just don't want to admit to ourselves. Yes. And somehow I think the worst thing you can do if you're feeling angry with your partner or you don't want to have sex with your partner is to force yourself to. And I think you really have to ask yourself, why am I angry or why why am I bored? What's actually underneath the boredom? And it might be something else. It might be sadness. I don't know. But there is something there that needs to be listened to. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think, yes, there are many things. And anger and resentment are sort of simmering away. I think that people who who have a relationship issues and then expect to have a great sex life, contrary to what I just said, which is different. I'm talking about an angry, passionate relationship as opposed to real deep-seated emotional problems. You cannot be happy in bed unless you're pretty happy out of it. When you open your legs to somebody, you open yourself, don't you? If you don't like them... You don't want to do it. Why would you want to do it with somebody that you don't like? So if you don't like your partner, you're not certainly not going to want to have sex with them. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. Thank you for listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. I do hope that you're going to become a supporter of ours because it does cost us money to make this programme and we couldn't do it without you. I'll give more details at the end of the programme. But one of the benefits of being a member and joining our supporters club is you can send us a letter and have it discussed by myself and my guest. My letter today for Tracy and I to discuss is this. Here we go, Tracy. My wife and I have been together for over a year and been married for 10 months. She had some bad experiences with giving blowjobs about five years ago with an ex who basically forced her when she was already doing it. That has since left her with some emotional scars, and as a result has absolutely refused to perform them on me since day one. I've been in relationships where I received it on multiple occasions, and can attest that this is one of the most incredibly satisfying experiences and sensations, not to mention the vulnerability of allowing someone to access that very sensitive part of myself. It has been over 18 months since I've received a blowjob and I find myself resenting my wife for being unwilling to fulfil such a deep need and desire. Mm. So what do you think, Tracy? I think it's a very difficult scenario because I can completely and utterly identify with the wife having been on the end of very unpleasant blowjobs where somebody's pushing your head down. It's not good. It puts you off for life. So any guys listening to this, if you want somebody to continue to give you oral sex, don't put your hands anywhere near the back of their head because it's not a nice experience. I think it's difficult because we have to acknowledge her distress, but I also agree with him in that oral sex is one of the most incredibly well, the most enjoyable part of sex, it certainly is for me. I mean, if my husband said, look, I'm not going to give you oral sex anymore, I don't really know what the hell I'd do, to be honest. So actually, let's let's put you on the spot. What would you do? Gosh, I'd have to, I mean, if it was some emotional issue, he'd be off to therapy before he could say off to therapy. <laughs> I'd just send him straight off. Because I just think for women, it's especially important because that's where most women get their orgasm from. So I think taking oral sex off the table for women is even worse than taking it off the table for men. But I just think find oral sex one of the most pleasurable parts. So as much as she has had a bad experience, I don't think you can then say, right, I'm never going to do that again. I think you have to say, look, I'll try. Are there ways around it? So I think you should say to her, look, this is so intensely pleasurable and important for me. Please can we at least give it a try? With some rules put in place, for instance, I will put my hands in the air. My my hands won't go anywhere near you, so you'll be in complete control. Absolutely only work on the head of the penis, which is the first inch or so, because as you know, that's where all the sensation is. 
make sure that she's in control, that she uses her hand, the game which stops anybody pushing you down and taking the penis in too far. There's so many practical things he could do. I think we should go one step further than him putting his hands in the air. I think they should get those sort of kinky handcuffs and handcuff his hands to the bed so he physically can't do that. Good idea. Even better idea, Andrew. I know that sounds a bit (laughs) much, but... I think the fear is that once the passion gets going, men start thrusting. In the moment of passion, what might they do? But if you know that their hands are cuffed and you've got the key, you're in control. And I think that's important. Your wife needs to feel in control. Yes. And that is a brilliant idea. Absolutely brilliant. And I think the other thing is we need to talk about this previous session. We need to actually hear what it was like and to really understand, you know, for a man, we need to really understand what it's like to feel out of control, particularly as us men, we don't know what that feels like because we're normally bigger and stronger. And I think we've really got to listen to how frightening that is. So perhaps you can explain to us, us poor men, because we we can't understand sometimes. So explain to us, Tracy. Gosh, as you were explaining that, I was mentally thinking in my brain about what it must be like to actually give oral sex to a man who's not very nice and pleasant to deal with, who would actually force me into doing something that I didn't want to do. And I felt utterly terrified. And I suddenly thought to myself, oh my God, of course she doesn't want to do it again. It's because you imagine you're in that position, you've got something in your mouth. Now having something in your mouth that could potentially choke you can kill you. It's that terrifying. He has that much control. And women are less powerful than men, no matter how strong the female is, and no matter how weedy the guy is, women are generally less powerful. So to be in that position, that vulnerable position with something in your mouth that's big, somebody who has the ability to push your head down and actually make life very unpleasant for you and and almost kill you is not a very nice sensation. God, we're going to put women off giving oral sex forever, (laughs) listening to that description. But it is important for men to just understand that because I think when you actually hear your partner's fear, when you hear your partner's disgust, it's not about you, it's about this previous experience. And so I think for men in this position, and I get so many messages on this, this is the most emotive topic on my website. Is it? Wow. Oh, easily the most emotive topic what happens is people go into their own area. You know, they go into their own bunker and get incredibly angry and anger pushes people apart. If you can listen to your partner's distress and actually think, it's not about me, Mm. this is about somebody in the past. That's a huge, important leap to make. So you say to your wife, I'm going to listen to you and I'm going to remember all the way through. It's not about me. It's about something that happened in the past so I can truly listen to you and truly understand it. And we're not going to have this conversation and then, you know, I'm then guaranteed sex. Mm. You're just actually entering into what it is like to stand in the shoes of your partner and to really understand it. Mm. And I think if you really understand them, they will then also begin to understand what it's like for you. Yes. And this is going to sound weird. Oral sex is often actually you feel more sensitive with it. The feelings are stronger often than uh, with penetrative Mm. sex. So, you know, of course, you're going to want to experience that. And I think if you can actually explain how you feel, they will hear you, but only if you've heard them first. Yes, very, very good point. Typical of me to go straight to the nuts and bolts of the practical bit. (laughs) It's it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Just (laughs) that we need both of those things. We need the nuts and bolts and people forget about the nuts and bolts, but we need the listening too. We need both of these things. Because it must have been absolutely horrifying for her. I mean, it's not a pleasant experience at all. And I wonder, I mean, if it wasn't pleasant at all, chances are she probably hasn't told anyone. So just actually talking about it and reliving it with her partner could be the step forward to actually breaking the hold these experiences have on her. And then I think we need to find out and listen from her what would make it easier to try it. Yes, and what does she need? What What does she need? need? 
in order to try it. And we could perhaps make it sort of fun. I mean, uh, this is probably back to Trace's nuts and bolts, but I'm thinking of those whipped cream um, scenarios. I mean, am I am I being silly? I reckon maybe that will. I think that would come later, though. I think also she has to realise that probably that first time, and he has to realise, it's not going to be fun. It's probably not going to be that pleasurable. It's going to be an experience that they have to try and get through. And it might take her several attempts before she can actually get to the point where she enjoys it. And that's when you bring in, I think, the whipped cream and the fun bit and the, you know, all that sort of stuff. Because, I I mean, it, this is another thing about sex that, that actually gets to me. is when people say, I don't want to give my partner feedback or direction and say, put it there, do that, do this, because it's not going to be a very sexy session. It's like, no, it's not going to be a very sexy session. But the one after that will be, and the one after that will be. So not every sex session has to be really sexy. And probably their first attempt at her giving him oral sex might not be the sexiest thing. It might be just something that she starts and actually says, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. And then the next time she does it for a little bit longer. It might take a few baby steps before they actually get to where she takes him through to the finish. So I think actually reflecting back over this hour, the thing that's actually struck me the most is this idea that each sex session doesn't have to be wonderful. There are going to be some that are going to be about learning. There are going to be some that are going to be kind. There's some that are going to be passionate. We sort of have this idea that they've all got to be five star and they've all got to be five star in the passion. They've got to be five star in the connection. They've got to be five star in the things to do in the bedroom before you're 50 category. And actually, you can have a sex session where it's not particularly exciting, but actually you break through a taboo and that that actually will be really wonderful in the longer scheme of things. The time when you just actually lie there and stroke each other and just sort of sink into that sort of togetherness and maybe even end up chatting about what was on Netflix the other time, just sort of being together and holding each other. Actually, that's really rather nice too. Yes. Thank you for reminding me that because our conditioning is so great, isn't it, that we have got to have great sex all the time, but actually there's all sorts of other sex to have as well. So thank you for that. Is there anything from our talk today that has struck you that you will take away from this? Yes, you can tell the difference between who's the therapist, who's doing therapy sessions, and who is the person writing books, because I forget, I'm so nuts and bolts practical that I absolutely forget about, I feel awful about the oral sex thing, and of course I should have started it with, you've got to listen to her. I don't know whether it's because I have absolutely no problem communicating with sex that I always assume everybody else does, and I assume they've already had that chat, but yeah, I, I learned from the session today that I'm very focused on the mechanics and the quick fix solutions. And sometimes I should probably be, dare I use the word, more spiritual. That's, this is another reason why, you know, the sensate focus technique. I've never really got that. I'm like, why would you do that? Why would you not just get straight into it? And now I'm over 50. I get it. I get that nothing's all rushed. And it doesn't have to be as practical and manual. Isn't it interesting that here I am, I'm over 60, you're over 50, and what they say is that the first half of our life, we generally tend to be stereotypically men and stereotypically women. So in the first half of our lives, I would be, let's get down with the nuts and bolts, let's get down to business, and you would be saying, well, let's talk about the feelings. No, I think I was always a man. <laughs> I was always nuts and bolts. And then in the second half of life, we sort of have to almost cross-dress. The men have got to actually think about, you know, what about the feelings? Let's let's actually connect rather than just waggle our bits in the same room. <laughs> and women say, well, you know, forget all of this blooming, you know, connecting and soft lights and music. Let's let's get down to business. <laughs> I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I, one of the chapters in the book was women don't have low libidos, we're bored. And lots of women post 50 just want exciting sex, something a bit different. Push me, please push me out of my comfort zone. Whereas as a younger woman, you're like, can I stay in my comfort zone? Whereas now I want to be. So that's a very good, that's a, that's a really good scenario is you do have to swap stereotypical gender roles as you get older. Really good. That's my favourite thing. So... You've come here as a witness to talk about what makes life meaningful. So let's actually just get right down to personal stuff. What makes your life meaningful, Tracy? Well, 
Weirdly, I ended up, well, not weirdly, like probably many people with the virus, COVID-19, I ended up having to stay in Australia for five months rather than the five weeks that I was expecting. But the thing is, it turned out to be the most marvellous time because I got to spend time with my family because all my family live in Australia. And it was really incredibly good for me because I didn't have much there. I refused to go out and buy that much. So I just thought I'm always buying stuff. I'm just going to keep it simple. I had nature. I had my mum. I had my family. I had dogs around me. I had fresh air. And it just absolutely brought back to me that the meaning of life is just family and friends and love. And that's it. The three things. It really is. Anything else doesn't. Family, friends, love. And I think you're going to throw nature in as a bonus as well. Nature, absolutely. Dogs. And culture. I love culture. I love good books. I like good wine. I love restaurants. But if I had to name just three things, it would be friends, family, love, and maybe dogs and nature chucked in. <laughs> That's five things. I had, we, you know, had great plans about retiring to the south of France and all that sort of stuff. And after this holiday, I suddenly thought, you know what? The south of France is absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful, far more beautiful than the area in Australia that we would spend time with. But what's the point of it without people that you love there? It's all about the people that you love and being near them. Tracy, I think I'm going to say I love you. <laughs> it's it's been, in, in, a, in the broad kind of sense of the word, because we've connected today and connection is important. So It is. We go back a very, very long way, you and I. We've known each other for a long time, haven't we? I've read, I think, every single one of your books, which I think are fantastic. And you're very perceptive and you've taught me some things, which is, which is unusual for me. And you've taught me a lot of things as well. So thank you very much for being on the <laughs> programme today. My pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.